This bad boy right here is the T500 still, a very popular beginner still for good reason, and this is the whiskey that I've just made in it. It's a next step kind of recipe, so if you're wanting to make a step past sugar wash, but not get a whole lot of expensive equipment, this is the one for you. It's got real grain in it, it's flavoured with real wood, and I'm going to show you step by step exactly how I made it. How's it going Chasers? I hope you're having a kick-ass week. I'm Jesse and this is Still It. So, like I said in the introduction, we are going to be making a whiskey that is not quite a beginner whiskey and not quite an advanced whiskey. It is a next step whiskey. So it's going to take you past the all sugar stuff. So whether you're doing, uh, basically making vodka and adding essences to it, or you're doing something kind of like UJSSM, where you're using real corn to flavor it, but you're not mashing that corn we're going to go to the next level and even better the only equipment you're going to need is the t500 itself obviously uh, some fermenters obviously and a brew in a bag bag the basic rundown is we're going to use the t500 itself as a mash tun and i've got specific volumes of grain and water and all those sort of things to make it nice and easy for you we're going to go step by step and then we're going to match that with two times that volume in sugar wash. So if you've been worried about getting into all grain, well, this is a great place to start because if you mess up the all grain wash beyond all recognition and you get no sugar out of it, you've still got the sugar as a safety net and the grain will still flavor it. This recipe is designed to age much more quickly, more like in a month, Obviously longer is probably going to be better, uh, but we've added a whole lot of flavors indicative of older whiskies into the base spirit using specialty grains. This whole thing revolves around the T500. I decided to make a recipe specific to this thing because so many people that are starting out in the hobby are using this still. But of course, if you have a different setup, you can adjust this to work on your setup as well. So uh, obviously we're gonna need the T500 and for now, we're not gonna need the top half of this. We can get rid of this guy and just use the pot. Now ideally, you're gonna to wanna to set this thing up in a position where you have something really, really strong that you can throw a rope of directly above you. Now, you don't have to do this, but if you can, it's gonna make things a whole lot easier later on. Ah, sorted and ready. You are probably starting to realize that this is gonna be a little bit more work. You're putting in a whole lot more effort, to be honest, than something like a sugar wash. But let me tell you right now, guys, you're gonna be rewarded for that. It is well, well worth it. Luckily for you, the sponsor of today's video puts the work in for you, so you don't need to. Did I just pull off a uh, Linus Tech Tips style segue? I think I did. So a huge, huge thank you to Geology for sponsoring this video. A skincare brand, I know. What gives? I get it guys, but hear me out on this one. Look at me guys, I'm not exactly the, uh, the fashionista type, right? <laughs> you know that if you've been watching videos for any length of time. But the thing is, I've been using geology now for quite some time. In fact, I challenge you, go back and have a look through the videos and see if you can tell me when I started using it, because I tell you right now, it's working wonderfully for me. The best part is that this product really is no fuss. Uh, it's a minute in the morning, a minute at night, and it does what it says it's going to do. Geology aren't into those random fads that come and go. They're not into that weird stuff that they're gonna try and sell you on late night television. Instead, they're into simple, clinically proven ingredients that are formulated into products that are actually going to work for you. Even better, this is not a one-size-fits-all product, so use the special link in the description below which will take you to the Geology website and the 30-day skin pack. They'll ask you a bunch of questions and they will formulate a specific routine that is going to work for you. Even better guys, use this code here, STILL30, and get yourself a nice little discount. Anyway, back to the whiskey. This is an optional step, but if you're ever going to do things like this again in your T500, it's going to save you a whole lot of time. Measure 23 centimeters from the bottom of your pot and mark a small line. This indicates the 16 liter fill point in your T500. At a bare minimum, you can use a sharp object to scratch a little score line into the side of the pot, uh, but if you have the tools, it's going to make things a whole lot easier. 
you will want to do exactly the same thing for the 20 litre mark which can be found 29 centimetres from the bottom of the pot. Next fill the pot up to the 16 litre mark and start heating it up. To find out the exact temperature you're aiming for you're going to need a strike water calculator. Luckily there is one on the Chase the Craft website. I'll put a link for it down in the description below. If you're working in metric into 16 litres as the volume of water and 8.5 kilograms as the weight of grain. If you're working in freedom units that is going to be 18.7 pounds of grain and 4.22 gallons of water. Next enter the temperature of the grain itself or even just the ambient temperature of the room and the calculator will spit out your desired strike water temperature. If you can't be bothered doing any of this just aim for roughly 74 degrees Celsius or 165 Fahrenheit. You're also going to want to organize two to four liters of cold water and two to four liters of boiling water at your disposal. So while we're waiting for it to get up to temperature, let's get the rest of this little setup all ready to roll so we're not caught with our pants down later on. First of all, our Bruna bag bag. Once again, obviously you don't need to use this specifically. You can make one out of a couple of pillowcases and sew it together if you're handy, but for six bucks or five bucks USD. I mean, it's easy enough to just grab one. Uh, by the way, team, there'll be links for all of this stuff down in the description uh, if you are looking for specific examples that I suggest using. Anyway, so the, the literally all we need to do with this guy is it goes inside the pot. Most of these bags, the good ones anyway, come with a, a drawstring that's gonna make this process easier. Uh, so literally all we wanna do is sort of cinch that down right on the top just under that lip on the T500. Once you have that knot tied off relatively tight, you can actually go around and use these clips as basically a, a second <laughs> layer of defense till you're losing your bag into the pot. Before we mash in, and we're gonna get onto that really quickly, let's have a quick talk about the ingredients that are going into this mash itself. Uh, so first, we have water. That is our main ingredient. We're using Munich malt, it's a base malt. It has the diastatic power to convert itself, plus some other stuff, uh, and it adds quite a lot of extra flavor to what we're doing. Um, this sort of all grain recipe that we're making here, we are, overdoing the flavor a little bit in this recipe because we're going to dilute it down with the sugar later on. So Munich, uh, and we're going to mix that with some of the ale malt as well, um, just to crowbar in a little bit of complexity. So different flavors coming from the two different malts. It's nice to have them both, uh, and more complexity down the end of the line is, is something that we're after. Next up, we have the oats. Now guys, please, please, uh, if you can get quick oats, or speedy oats, sometimes they call them grain flecked oats, steam rolled oats, uh, basically something that's already been gelatinized. So if you take this stuff and it turns into porridge, damn near instantly when you're making porridge, uh, that's already gelatinized. And that means that we don't have to do a cereal mash, which is great. So just be aware of that. Uh, the reason we're putting oats in is to help combat the sugar a little bit further on down the track in that uh, a lot of sugar to me often comes across across quite, it's not a alcohol heat, but it's kind of this weird uh, piercing sensation on the tongue. It's, it's kind of the opposite of a thick, full-bodied whiskey. Uh, and oats are gonna give us a little bit, hopefully a little bit more uh, mouthfeel by being in the mix. Next up, Dark Crystal. We're slamming flavor in there. <laughs> This we're bumping up the sweetness a little bit. We're trying to get a little bit of that caramelly notes going on in there. Uh, but guys, these specialty malts, you wanna be careful with. Use them at low percentages and don't overdo them. So even in this sort of recipe, I wouldn't suggest adding more of these. At this stage, try it like this and then boost it up next time if you wanna mess with it. Um, but more is not always better. Uh, and last of all, we have the chocolate. They call it chocolate malt dark sort of cocoa-y chocolate but really it adds a little bit of sort of coffeeness, burnt toast, all of those really dark Maillard reaction sort of flavors come in spades with this guy here. If you're struggling to find out where to buy this stuff from look for your closest local homebrew store and when I say homebrew store I mean beer. The beer guys have got the stuff nailed, the uh, supply chains and the distribution is just off the charts compared to any of the other sort of people. This is the best place to get it from. Uh, if you're in America, I will put a link for Adventures in Homebrewing, which very kindly helped the channel out with some affiliate links. They'll be able to sort you out with all of this stuff. 
uh, and they'll even post it out anywhere in the country as well for not too much when it comes to postage. Uh, but other than that, find your local homebrew store. This stuff needs to be milled before it goes into the mash. Now you can buy yourself a mill and mill it at home, which is what I do, but any good homebrew store will mill it for you. I think we're about done. Let's get back to our pot. So when you start getting close to your strike water temperature, strike water is literally just the, the water that we heat up before we mash in, uh, use a thermometer. These numbers do actually matter. You need to get them fairly freaking close. So within half a degree centigrade, ideally would be great. Uh, and another tip is, especially when you're using something like this that heats directly from the bottom, uh, give it a good stir up before you take your me measurement uh, to make sure you're on target and the water hasn't stratified out too much within your vessel. Yep, good to go. So from here on in, uh, don't rush, don't do anything crazy, but you wanna be moving relatively quick, not standing around talking like this guy. So you don't wanna do it super slow because then you start losing temperature, uh, but you do not wanna chuck all of this grain in all of a sudden because we get dough balls and dough balls are the enemy of a mash. <laughs> Basically what happens is the grain can stick together uh, and form a ball and the inside of that ball, although it is completely immersed in water, can be bone dry. If the grain is bone dry, then you're not mashing it and you're losing that efficiency. So it's just taking up room and doing absolutely nothing for you. You're throwing money down the sink. So tip a little grain in, give it a good stirring, Make sure you don't see any balls. Uh, that's why I like to use this. I use a little bowl so I can grab uh, grain out of my big pot down here and add a little in. At this stage, uh, you will have a extremely thick porridge in front of you. And the reason for that is that I have reserved a little bit of space and a little bit of water uh, to be able to adjust our temperatures here. So uh, ideally you're aiming for somewhere between 64 and 65 degrees celsius once again that's this in freedom units uh, and that is why we have the boiling water and the cold water on hand so if you've overshot that temperature you can bring it down a little bit with the cold water if you've undershot it you can bring it up with the hot water honestly guys as long as you're sitting somewhere between 63 degrees celsius and 66 maybe 67 degrees celsius we're pretty good. Now, we are definitely gonna wanna top this up uh, to about as full as we can get it because this is a very, very thick mash, especially with those oats. And once again, the whole point of this is if you completely fail, if you completely fail and you only convert half the sugar that's available to us in this pot, then the actual sugar we're gonna add in later on has got your back and you don't have to stress about it. So, do your best, don't stress about it, keep moving. So I would suggest adding about two liters at this stage, uh, giving it a really good stir to help stir it up, and then add the, the rest of that four liters and give it another stir, just um, just because we are pushing things on volume here. <laughs> I'm at 63.8, I'm happy with that. Uh, let's get this thing covered up, insulated, and we let it sit for 30 minutes. So roughly 30 minutes into the process, uh, we're gonna strip all of this stuff off and give it another good stir. Uh, and when you do, you're going to notice that it has loosened up significantly. And the reason for that is that the enzymes in the barley that came along with the barley uh, are going to work and they're breaking all that stuff down into sugar, which is what our yeast is gonna eat later on. Once you've given it a decent stir, cover it back up, insulated again and we're going to leave it for one hour. Yes, we're going to mash this for an hour and a half because we can. Why not? <laughs> While this guy is resting for another hour, we've got the perfect opportunity to get our inverted sugar going. This is kind of a step where your results may vary. Not necessarily because empirically I think it's different, but I think I, I guess what I mean is that some people are more susceptible or more um, able to taste the sugar flavor. It's more offensive to them that you get from a product that has been distilled from uh, fermented sugar. Uh, if you want to know more about this and kind of why I'm saying this disclaimer to you, uh, you can go ahead and watch the video over here that I just did recently. Personally, 
I would like to think that we're going to lower the impact of the fact that we're using sugar uh, in this whiskey by inverting the sugar. It's up to you though. But to be honest, this step really isn't difficult. All you need to do is uh, take the six kilos of sugar. I am lucky enough that I've got a pot big enough to do all six together. Obviously, if you don't, you can do this in two steps and you've got an hour. Uh, you'll easily get two of these done in an hour. So, you know, it's, it's not a big deal. Anyway, so sugar goes into the pot plus the four liters of water and two teaspoons of cream of tartar. Uh, if you don't have cream of tartar, which honestly you can get damn near anywhere in the bakery aisle, uh, citric acid or anything else like that, you can switch it out for, not a big problem. Basically an acid just helps to split the glucose and the fructose apart from each other, which is what inverted syrup is. And then we bring it up to a simmer for 20 minutes. Once this has been doing its thing for 20 minutes, uh, we can move it aside, be super freaking careful with it because that is hot. That will mess you up. <laughs> be careful. But we're gonna move that over to the side and let that sit for a little while to cool down. We're gonna deal with this thing now. So uh, the blankets can come off or whatever you're insulating it with can come off and get it back underneath uh, where you have your rope. I'm really hoping you have a rope right now. If you don't, I'm sorry guys. <laughs> All right guys, this uh, probably isn't gonna be pretty, <laughs> but you'll get the idea. Uh, take it slow, move slowly. Um, this thing is really heavy and it is hot, so you you don't want to spill it all over yourself. Um, you can tie it to the drawstring if you want. I never trust the drawstring and I don't trust the stitching, so I like to tie it uh, around the bag like so. But the uh, the easiest way is just to inch it up a little bit from here. If you have a block or a pulley up top, awesome, all for it. Every time you move it up a little bit, you're going to want to stop and pause uh, and let things drain a little bit. Uh, and the reason for that is if you don't, especially uh, with a large full bag, you're gonna end up with a whole lot of spillage like you just saw. <laughs> uh, and it'll get to a point where you can just uh, quickly pop it up like that. Once it's up and above the, the top of the, the, sort of the edge of the pot, the liquid will sort of run down the outside of the bag and drip off at the bottom. So it's just that sort of middle point where the bag is too full to go quick up and um, you know too wide to get past the edge of the pot that's a little bit tricky. But once you get it to this point, uh, you can tie it off. I'm gonna do that now, down here. My hands are sticky and I can't move the camera, so you're not gonna see this happen. <laughs> not a bad time to clean up some of your mess. Because uh, this stuff is super freaking sticky. You can't just let this hang for about 10 minutes. If you wanna speed things up, the best way to do it is to twist the bag uh, and use the tension that sort of twisting it creates to basically uh, help squeeze it a little bit. So once the bag has slowed down to pretty much just a, a really slow drip, uh, what we're gonna do is grab another bowl and we're gonna pull the old switcheroo. So we're just gonna get this out and this under to keep catching any more little drips that come off uh, while we're working with this. All right, so all of this is now gonna go over into our fermenter. If you're using multiple fermenters, if you don't have one large fermenter, you instead have you know three or four little buckets, that is completely fine. Just uh, divide it roughly evenly between however many fermenters you've got. Uh, I was gonna use small fermenters, but all my little fermenters are actually in use right now, so I'm using the big guy. Into the fermenter goes your all grain wort, one cup of chopped raisins, our inverted sugar syrup, and enough water to make it up to 60 liters or 15.8 gallons. You can use hot or cold depending on what you need to make it 22 degrees Celsius or 71 degrees Fahrenheit. Everything that needs to be in the fermenter is in the fermenter other than the yeast. And uh, just to let you know, I've ended up with 60 liters at uh, 1071. Honestly guys, don't stress about those numbers too much. As long as you're somewhere between 1060 and 1080, you're gonna be fine. So just the whole point of this recipe is not to stress about it. You don't have to hit specific points along the way and you're still gonna get a result at the end. Let's talk yeast. If you wanna use baker's yeast, go right ahead. I get it. Um, 
you know, some of these strains can be a little bit pricey. I am gonna be using a blend of uh, SO4 uh, and Mangrove Jack's New World Strong Ale yeast. I'm not so stressed about this one. I just want another yeast uh, that is, you know, pretty good at cleaning up a higher ABV. This is where I'm hoping to get a little bit of extra flavor from. So I'm gonna pitch two of these and four of these. If you're pitching a brewer's yeast uh, into this, I would suggest that you need at least 60 grams, probably 60 to 100 grams of yeast. If you're using baker's yeast, um, I mean, I'd use a little bit more just cause you have it, right? Anyway, uh, let me get these into the fermenter and we're done for the night. This is gonna ferment away for, I don't know, a week, two weeks, we'll distill it when it's ready. Actually, before I do do that, uh, I'm gonna take a second to say, you don't need to take a starting gravity, you really don't. But, uh, if you want to be able to troubleshoot in any way, shape or form later on, if you wanna be able to know if your fermentation is finished, if you wanna know what the ABB was, any of those sort of things, taking a gravity reading now is gonna save you a whole lot of headaches later. This is a hydrometer. It only works before uh, distillation. It's for pre-fermentation and post-fermentation. Um, and I would thoroughly, thoroughly suggest you get one of them. Once again, there's uh, links in the description down below. Uh, and there's a video up here if you wanna know how to use the damn things. Ferment this as close to 25 degrees Celsius as you can. I have let this thing ferment for two weeks, but guys, please, please, please don't think uh, that you let it for ferment for two weeks and that's what you do and you just move on to the next step. Really the only way to know if you've actually finished fermentation is with one of these guys, a hydrometer. But basically as long as you get readings that are in the expected range you're looking for for about three days in a row and stable, you know you're done. Mine's fermented out below zero, but honestly, if you get anywhere sort of below 1.005 uh, and it's evened out there, I'd probably call it done. Uh, now, you need to get the stuff out of the fermenter and into your T500. A couple of things to note here. Number one, do not trust the max fill line that comes, you know, built in on the T500. That's fine for sugar washes, but uh, things made from all grain have a tendency to bubble and uh, there's more protein in it. It forms bubbles and keeps bubbles longer, which means it is more likely to puke or boil over. That's literally where it just keeps bubbling up, bubbling up, bubbling up like a pot of soup and eventually it just you know, spills out through your condenser. So uh, that's why I got you to put that 20 liter line in there earlier on. Keep it below that. Don't go above that with an all grain. And also, uh, how do you get it out of the fermenter and into the T500 if you're using a larger fermenter? Especially, uh, well, you can siphon or rack across, which is great. That's awesome way to do it. Honestly, for something like this, I prefer the old fashioned pot. None of this high tech siphoning business around here. <laughs> uh, honestly, it's just easier for me, guys. I don't. I like doing it, uh, and it helps me, allows me to degas as I pour as well. You know, you pour it from a height, you get some of that CO2 out of there, and that's going to help you even more when it comes to puking. Now it's time to get the T500 set up and running. So get the lid and the column back on top, the clamps on. Uh, but we are going to make a slight adjustment to the setup of the water. Because we're making whiskey, we do not want the active reflux that the T500 normally gives us. And the easiest way to do that is simply to disconnect the water input from the right hand side of the machine, uh, reconnect the water input to the bottom of the condenser on the left side of the machine. That's the little skinny pipe that's uh, sitting out by itself over to the left uh, and then have the water out coming out of the top and over into your sink. Um, if this sounds really complex to you and weird, uh, you can actually just set it up so you have the best of both worlds. I've got a video showing you how to do that over here. Now that we're set up, you've got water connected, you're going to want to run a fair bit of water through this while we're running because the T500 isn't really set up to be used as a pot still like this, but we're going to make it work anyway. Don't worry about temperatures anywhere. The thermometers don't mean anything in this. Turn that bad boy on and let it run. We're doing a stripping run, which means we don't care about the flavors coming out. We don't care about cuts. We're not making cuts at all. We're just cutting down the volume so we can add it all into the spirit run later on. Like I said just before, I'm not making cuts. I am just collecting into one big vessel, but obviously we have to decide when to stop this run. Uh, so I'm not monitoring anything. I'm not worried about the temperature. I'm not worried about the speed. I'm just going as fast as it'll possibly go the whole way through. We're just cutting down on volume until we get down to about 
coming off the spout. Now you can stop at 20% if you want, it's not going to change things a whole lot, you're just going to get slightly less product in the end. Uh, you can go down to 10%, you'll get slightly more product, but you'll use a little bit more power and you're gonna to have to be sitting here waiting for it a whole lot longer as well. The easiest way to test if you're down to 10%, obviously, is to use an alchemeter. Once you get down to that 10%, you can flip the switch, turn it off, empty it out, fill it back up again and do the same thing all over again. Assuming that you've followed this recipe and you've done things, you know, roughly the same volumes as me, you're gonna end up uh, with enough volume in your fermenters to do this three times. So that's going to be three stripping runs in the sort of 16 to 20 litre range depending on exactly how much loss you have to ferment a tube and blah 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 blah. Now if you're going to do this all in one day and just bang it out uh, that's not too much of a problem. Collect all the low wines into a glass or stainless container ideally and you're going to be ready to go on to the next step. But if you're taking your time and maybe you're doing this, you know, you're running this still three times over a long weekend or once every night after work, for example, which is totally fine to do. The wash isn't going to go bad sitting in your fermenter. I would suggest storing it in relatively airtight containers. Uh, I use these uh, swing top jars. Yes, they are just like a silicone gasket. I wrap them in PTFE tape or plumber's tape, Teflon tape, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and these do a wonderful, wonderful job. Once you've done all three stripping runs, it's time to take all of those low wines, all of it, and bang it back into the T500. Now that I'm into the run and I've uh, collected a few jars, we're solidly into the run now. Let's have a little bit of a talk about how I'm running this and what I'm doing exactly with the still. First of all, if you have the ability to adjust the amount of power going into your still, I highly recommend it for this stage for the spirit run. It's not 100% necessary if you don't have a way to adjust the power. That's fine, that's fine. Just run it as normal. I'll show you a little clip of exactly how fast this is running so you can see what I'm aiming for here. In your situation, it'll almost certainly be different, but right now, just for an idea, I'm running on a little bit under three quarts power. Now, I'm also collecting into individual jars and the reason for this is that it allows me to switch them out now <laughs> and then go back and select my cuts later on. This video is not all about cuts. It's a that's a video in and of itself and I've got other videos. So I'll put them down in the description section down below. Uh, but what it means is that I can go back later uh, once the run is finished and sort of taste through and make a slow easy decision about exactly where I want to make the heads cut and the tails cut rather than having to do it on the fly on the still you know and then potentially messing it up not having a chance to adjust it. I'm a little bit reluctant to be honest to actually give you my cut points my exact cut points simply because I'm worried that people will uh, copy the numbers and rely on those rather than doing it proper yourselves so I, I will give them to you but guys please 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 <laughs> Use your senses. Wah, get out of here flies. Man, I had this covered up and I am fighting them off as soon as I undid it. Uh, anyway team, this is the whole run other than uh, some more tails that were just super tailsy, not even worth considering that are going straight into the faints jar. If you don't know guys, faints is basically the leftover stuff that I'm gonna hang on to and add back into another run in the future. That's a topic for another video if you're not sure what's going on. <laughs> so don't stress about that too much. Just know you can save it and reuse them. Just so you know team, the first two jars are going to be going into fire starter slash cleaning products. They're never gonna go back into any you know consumable product ever again. If you wanna call those four shots or whatever you wanna call them, that's fine. Just letting you know that's what I'm doing. This is a good illustration of why I separate into smaller jars when I'm doing a new run that I haven't done before. Coming off the still, I thought I was going to be switching from heads to hearts right around this spot, which is why I switched to the larger jars. Uh, but in actual fact, after going back and tasting them again, I'm going to switch here. So I'm probably going to take half of this jar and then switch at this point. These are relatively clean as far as heads go, but they kind of have this weird uh, sugar vodka thing going on that I just don't think fits uh, in this flavor profile that I'm after. Uh, if you want to keep them, that's entirely up to you. If you're looking for more volume, I am going to blend based on the idea that I want this to age quickly. So normally my products age for 
a year or you know six months at the absolute least i'm going to try and get these aged up in two months um, just because i think that the sort of people that are going to do this um, that's going to be probably more of a goal that they want to aim to so i'm going to see if we can do it because of that fact the the cuts are going to be a little bit tighter so basically the shorter the amount of time that you're wanting to age the product for the tighter the cuts are anyway so up here um, the typical uh, prickly on the tongue on the cheeks kind of acetone and nail polish remover sort of stuff so look out for that when you're uh, going for your heads down at the tails uh, it actually presented not so much as wet dog it changed from uh, the flavors i was getting here which i was talking about i'll talk about in a minute over to more of a uh old stale almost grassy kind of bread thing that's what i got first and decided to get rid of uh and then after this jar it started turning into the the wet dog wet cardboard um toe jam funk sort of stuff so keep an eye out for those in the main run we go from like i said a sugar vodka here through to some really interesting uh very light very volatile fruit but not acetone and weird sort of ester things more i think there's some influence from the yeast coming through in this area here and then progressively down this way it starts going through the grain flavors that we've got on there around this area we've kind of got the sweet barley thing going on between here uh biscuity toastiness starts fading in uh, and that toastiness stays with it all the way down until the tails and it sort of gets darker and darker as it goes so it goes from you know like a dark bread through to almost but not quite burnt toast which i quite like uh, and as we get closer down to the bottom here we're getting more of the uh, the sweeter caramel sort of stuff going on and some of the influence from the chocolate malt as well i would suggest uh, putting all of the hearts into one vessel at this stage don't split it up you know into different vessels at this point in time you want it to all homogenize back together basically and the faints whack those into another appropriate container and save those for a future date all right let me get this done before the flies just get out of control <laughs> All right, team, so it's been a couple of days since I blended, and here's two jars ready to go, ready to get wood put into them uh, and start aging. I'm gonna do two different versions, and what I haven't told you yet is that I actually took uh, a small amount of this spirit and force aged it to create this stuff here. Now, I did that for two reasons. Uh, one, so I can taste it for you in just a second and give you a better idea of what it's gonna taste like in a month's time and number two i kept the wood that i used from that force aging uh, right here and we're going to use that in one of these jars so the plan when aging these uh, is to age this significantly faster than what i normally do so normally i'm aiming for six months through to like two years of aging for this one i'm going to aim for more like a month and to accomplish what i want to accomplish in that month i'm going to be using a little bit more wood than normal uh, so i have these little dominoes of oak now these are kentucky bourbon staves that are sold for smoking and the reason i'm using these is this is probably the most widely available product that i would actually recommend using in this you can get it in most places around the world if not it's a little bit tricky to find uh, but it's definitely the most consistently available product uh, on average I've split them down into little dominoes that are six and a half centimeters by one and a half centimeters by two centimeters approximately and I'm going to be using seven of them now I have also charred these things quite substantially with the blowtorch to a point that I'd kind of call an alligator char now when you're doing this with a blowtorch if you're going to use a blowtorch I suggest taking your time use it at a bit of a distance get the wood hot back off let it sit for a while turn it over get it nice and hot back off let it sit for a while because what we want to do is we want to create kind of a gradient of um, supercharred wood uh, through sort of the the red wood that's been heated and cooked but not you know burnt obviously and then through to almost raw wood in the middle uh, i am going to be using seven of these little bad boys uh, in eh, this jar uh, 
Uh, and for this jar, we're going to be using exactly the same staves, exactly the same size staves, and exactly the same number of staves, but they have already been used uh, in the forced aged product. Get in there. The reason I'm doing this is that while these are Kentucky bourbon staves for sure, um, in terms of the amount of wood that's actually been affected by the spirit that we have in here, it's pretty freaking low and we've recharged it. So this is pretty much acting like new American oak. So what we have here is something that's more like a uh, Balcona style single malt. So it's a single malt recipe, like kind of a scotchy recipe, but we're putting a big new American oak influence on it. Over on this side, uh, what we have is the same sort of single malt base spirit, but we're using a second use oak much more like what the Scots are going to do. And I'm quite interested to see how these uh, differ over time. Really quickly, what you can expect to be different in these two is this is gonna have a big, heavy, um, bourbon-like wood influence on it. This is gonna be much more subtle. Uh, it's going to have less of that big upfront wood flavor and go more into the sort of delicate sweet notes that come out of the, the wood later on. All right, before I taste this stuff and let you know what you're in for if you make it yourself at home, I need to say a big, huge, giant thank you to the Patreons. Thank you so much, Patreons, for doing what you do. It lets me do what I do, and I am so very, very grateful for it. So I gotta say, guys, this does not smell like a sugar wash. It smells sweet and thick and oaky and it doesn't have any of that sugary presence to it which is great which is exactly what we're going with with this right we're going for the ease of sugar um, without the downside of it the sweetness of the crystal malts coming through there's a slight biscuity and almost toastiness coming off uh, from the base malts and we definitely have a little bit of action down in the really dark caramel not quite chocolatey, maybe like a really, really light milk chocolate, that sort of thing going on. Uh, anyway guys, bottoms up. Mm, I should, uh, should tell you too, I'm tasting this at uh, barrel proof, which was 55%. So it does have a fair bit of kick to it, and it hasn't mellowed due to age. Uh, and once again, the, the, the sugar side of things is, is pretty well suppressed. I can taste it a little bit, just a touch. Probably because I know I'm looking for it. If you blind tasted me, I don't know if I'd be able to get it, to be honest. But this uh, has quite a lot of complexity for a two day old whiskey, I gotta say. It has enough body there to give it a presence in the mouth. It has a lovely sweetness, uh, and I believe, I can't say for sure, but I believe that is coming from both the crystal and the wood. Uh, but it adds together and then combines with the uh, toastiness to almost be rum like. Think of like a dark toasted bread with butter and honey and almost banana on there as well. Have you guys had banana and honey on bread? That is freaking awesome. One of the things my grandfather got me addicted to. Uh, but anyway, and then on the lingering aftertaste, you get the hints of the darker stuff. Um, less chocolate and more coffee, to be honest. Uh, and then you have this really interesting wood thing sort of coming in and out of it. Uh, obviously my wood is gonna be different to your wood, so that may change as well, but for me, it is sitting somewhere between toffee and cherry with a fun like actual wood flavor. Um, probably more like sandalwood almost. Uh, but all in all guys, I'm really happy with this and I cannot wait to try the one month old version. This uh, I think could be a really cool format. So the format of doing one quote unquote real thing using the T500 and then you know bumping it up with the inverted sugar I think we could do a whole host of different genres. Uh, we could do a peated version, we could do a bourbon version, we could do a rye, we could do all sorts of crazy things. So if you're interested in that and you think that would be something fun to see and you think it has potential, drop a comment in the comment section down below and let me know what kind of spirit I should do next with this format. So there you have it guys. I really hope you enjoyed this video. It always takes extra work to make videos like these, but it is so much more rewarding for me. And it's even more rewarding when I know you guys enjoy it too. So if you liked it, please guys, give it a thumbs up. You know what that does, algorithm, things happen. Same thing down in the comments guys, that's great for the algorithm, but more importantly, it lets me know what you guys are thinking about my videos so I can make them better in the future and even try some of your ideas. Uh, and lastly guys, if you ain't subscribed,
sort it out. I'll catch you next time, guys. Keep on chasing the craft. See ya.